Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good night, depending on where in the world you are, and welcome to the Black Consciousness Festival and the first of our conversations on our last day today. Um, the festival aims at building awareness around how each of us can take the necessary steps for restitution and reparation. It brings me great honor today uh, to be the conversation lead and host of this conversation with Her Excellency. Tonica Sealy Thompson, uh, current Barbados ambassador to Brazil for the last two years with concurrent accreditation to Argentina and Chile. Ambassador Sealy Thompson brings more than 20 years of experience working internationally, beginning her career in financial services sector on returning from her Barbados national scholarship. She quickly moved on to what would become a long career in national service and working with international organizations. She's worked in trade and export development and also cultural production in the Caribbean and around the world. In fact, uh, Ambassador, that's how we first met years ago uh, when I was working with the cultural industry sector um, mm -hmm. and attended a conference um, and sort of a forum for people in the region in Martinique. And you were leading uh, one of the discussions on, on the film industry, I remember quite well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think our energies just kind of uh, aligned and, and we've kept in touch ever since. So welcome to this conversation. Thank you so much, um, Sean. And I'm so happy to be here, to make the time today um, to be here at this important event. And thanks also for setting the very warm context in which we met and connected um, doing what we love, which is, you know, participating in these spaces that bring people together. Mm -hmm, definitely. So moving right into the, the meat of the matter, um, this festival is the Black Consciousness Festival. Um, and really the genesis of this festival is rooted in the celebration of Black Consciousness Day in Brazil on November 20th. So mm -hmm. tell, tell us a little bit about what does Black Consciousness mean to you? Well, I, I think first of all, I like the, the key word here that you use and what stands out for me is this question of celebration. And um, the first thing I'd like to say is today is such an important day for us in Barbados. Definitely. It's our National Independence Day. So to anybody listening um, and everybody listening, I invite you all to, to join me in wishing Barbados um, and the people of Barbados a happy Independence Day. Yeah. And, you know, as we think about independence, um, you know, beyond celebration, there are all these questions about the consciousness that we bring to what it means. And of course, uh, for us in the Caribbean, there's, there's not much separation between what it means to think within this framework of being proud of who you are, being proud as black nations and um, celebrating your independence. The, the, our feeling, our sensation of pride, um, is 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 very much rooted in some of these principles of how we um, move forward with the intention of constantly making a world where there's not just pride involved, but a construction, um, a construction of a kind of uh, not just identity, but a kind of being altogether um, that represents the tenets of Black consciousness, as you as you've outlined them, and and I want to say that. One of the things that it means for me to be able to have this kind of conversation in this moment, speaking from Brazil, speaking as Barbados's ambassador, is um, is 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 uh, the coin the confluence mm -hmm. of celebrations um, 
that forces you, whether you like it or, or not, to think about all of these things and how they relate to each other. Mm -hmm. So just as a matter of, you know, um, wishing someone a happy independence or sharing my national date, um, when I'm in with the Barbadian community, for example, in, in Brazil, I'm primarily among descendants. And what they as Brazilians are thinking about is Black Consciousness Day and Black mm. Consciousness Month. Right. And in fact, it, one of the things it means for me is how do we leverage all of the um, energies, ideas, mm. creative intent, you know, call for change, yeah. which yeah. are seated in this very beautiful um, kind of practice of commemoration mm -hmm. and how do we move it into um you know as you say in your introduction this this really constructive space so it's about thinking intersectionally about celebration as well Absolutely. thinking sensitively about what it means um this year one had to think twice before wishing persons a happy black consciousness day be because of the unfortunate event that um, took place. There was a lot of sadness around and I expressed the, my condolences to the family and friends and to all the people um, of Brazil who, who felt the suffering of that death as deeply uh, as I know um, we all felt it. Um, so I think, you know, I have to, we have to choose. All, we're all in joy and in sadness and anger and in peace, you know, in hope. We have to go through these things. And for me, I think it's very, very important for all of us, wherever we are, to contemplate what it means to embody all of those, that range of things, rather than believing that we can only be, for example, professors or students, or in my case, diplomats. Correct, correct. And Barbados celebrates uh, 54 years of independence today. Yes, um, right. Which is a significant landmark. Um, and as a fellow Caribbean citizen, I also want to extend a happy independence date to yes. Barbados. And, and many of my Barbadian, Bajan friends who, you know, yes. I grew up with and went to school with. And 54 is, is, is no small achievement. I mean, in the scheme of things, Barbados is, in, in the world's history, Barbados is a young nation, but yet Barbados is taking uh, so many um, interesting steps in leadership in the region and beyond. Um, and, and I want to turn our conversation to that, um, to, to Barbados' realities post-independence, if you wanted to just comment a little bit on that. This is, this is um, <laughs> I, would, I would love to. I think this is a really unanswerable question in as much as I'm going to give you an answer about the things that I find most, um, most critical to note about where we are in this current moment. Yeah. Um, the reason I think that it's, it, you know, I think that independence definitely marks a moment in our history, which we should never, ever forget or fail to celebrate. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, this sense of what happened on the very day that people were told that they were free or they had some sense, or they've con you know, conjured an idea also of what it meant to be free of something. Mm -hmm. um, that is really, really important. It's sort of like a birthday, you know. It, all, we don't always, um, we don't always <clears throat> re recall, for example, what our mothers may have been going through at the time of our births, and what they may have been going through, not just in the moment, <laughs> but uh, in the days and in the months afterwards. Yeah. And so um, that's why I say there's a certain unanswerability to this thing of marking the moment as important as it is to mark, because in a sense, we're very much in that process of, um, um, you know, perpetual pursuit of a kind of freedom that is truly um, about human beings being free and free, we're talking economically, um, you know, intellectually free to live their lives um, with respect and dignity. And so I, I say that to introduce the idea that I, I couldn't, to be honest with you, Sean, um, think of a moment where I may have preferred <laughs> to serve my country. Um, and I, I will begin by making reference to the Prime Minister of Barbados, the Right Honourable Mia Amor Motley, and some of the initiatives she's been leading at a glo global level. And to just bring it a little bit closer down to the moment and to the spaces where we are, 
um, Brazil hit 6 million people recently, you know, went over 6 million people of COVID infections. And one of the things about my prime minister's leadership is that I think she beyond offering an example of what care at the center of leadership looks like, um, offers to the rest of the world an example of how one can be creative, innovative, one can make representation, one doesn't also lose sight of one's uh, um, call or, or, or purpose of, of requesting increasing freedoms and increasing um, space in the world to be, um, to be a presence. Mm -hmm. And so our prime minister's fight for COVID, uh, you know, the, the way she protected not only the country, but the region in a certain stance, um, um, has just been a, a phenomenal small example of this huge impact that I believe my country is having on the world as we speak. I also um, wanted to mention that in, um, you know, this favorite word, but we have to, to, to use it because it's so good, in pivoting with the pressure of COVID, um, you know, we, my prime minister and her team of leaders has created a new visa in the face of something that could have crushed our tourism industry. In fact, we're 67% dependent on tourism, yeah. you know? So imagine what this lockdown and what um, the things we had to do to keep people safe mm -hmm. um, meant for the economy um, and an, an economy like ours. So <clears throat> one of the things that I point to as an example of innovation in the face of threat and challenge is this welcome stamp, which basically allows persons to come to Barbados and have the right to stay there for a year and work remotely. Um, and we can talk more about that. But those are two very current examples that I wanted to pull out from the many, many things that I could share with you. Barbados, you know, has rebooted its tax infrastructure and financial services infrastructure to ensure that we are compliant with the demands of global agencies that have um, that monitor these things and, you know, we find ourselves in the situation of having to, like many other Caribbean countries, um, make a stand uh, for the ways in which we are compliant and the ways in which we should be fairly understood and read and spoken about. And so, um, you know, I'm proud of all that my prime minister and leaders are doing at this time. And I think that those things are part of this continuum of independence and part of this reason why I think, you know, you step back from marking just a day or, you know, a color by by really taking stock of um, what kinds of moves we're able to make in the face of adversity. And I think that's how you really measure a nation. For sure. Um, and, and some of the things that you said, you know, really struck um, a chord with me, um, primarily because, you know, COVID has affected me personally. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, I was in Brazil doing some some research for my PhD, and God, you know, COVID kind of interrupted that, and then everything that happened to me subsequently. And one of the things that that you said um, that I think resonated with me significantly is this notion of of freedom, which is so um, tenuous for us in the re in the Caribbean region because our history started off as a region, started off as a place where freedom was was only for the very few. And, and we've moved past that to all become independent nations. But all of the things that, that Barbados and, and uh, the Honorable um, Mia Motley has been championing, especially in this very critical period of mankind's history, humankind's history, is mm -hmm. rooted in, this, in, this, in preserving and elevating and treasuring this concept of freedom. So all of the policies that you talked about and all the initiatives that you talked about are really about ensuring that everybody, whether Barbadian or not, um, ha has options and has the ability to be as free as possible. I myself, um, you know, and, and I don't want to get into trying to integrate with politics because that's another story, but our, our policies and actions don't necessarily align with um, that, that uh, understanding of freedom as Barbados does. So, so I'm, I'm really happy to hear your, your, your take on that and, and to say that I, I really truly um, believe that Barbados is, is at the, the leading uh, face of, of the Caribbean when it comes to dealing with issues of freedom um, and subsequent independence, obviously. 
I think, I mean, one of the things that um, I, I, I feel called to say um, to you and also to your audience who, who are listening um, is that this question of national freedoms and how we treat to each other in the region is, is, is a source of reflection to the extent that serving outside of one's national um, region, one quickly finds that the barriers between who is from which nation um, quickly drop away. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have been inspired by is the way in which in different fora, this sense of a Caribbean-ness has also emerged with a much greater force um, or with this in increased force for me. I don't want to measure a point in time when it wasn't there because right. it's, of course, um, you know, it could be relative. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I certainly have enjoyed is the way in which the call to the national is always and already a call to the regional for us. Yeah. And, you know, when I, when I, which is why I also find it very, 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 um, I feel honored to be in a program where, you know, you as a host in Trinidad and Tobago and I as a, you know, as a servant in um, Brazil of my country, Barbados, mm -hmm. can think about what it means to learn from each other yeah. and what it means to also recognize that there are different moments in history where strengths uh, come to the fore. Yeah. So as I said to you, this is the perfect time for us, I think, to be in the positions of service that we're in. Mm -hmm. And when I say us, I mean you in the university, um, you, myself, you know, we're in positions where we can understand that no one government is its own, you know, is its own, uh, made itself, yeah. you know, even as a collective entity, we are constantly in this um, constellation of relations and learning and care. And that's some of the things that I learned at the intersection of being here as a national representative, but mm -hmm. having a community um, that included Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Guyana and Suriname, who I would also love to say hello to if they're logged in. Um, but th that, that sense of regionalism and being able to look and say, okay, well, Jamaica is really good at this. How do we learn from them because maybe we're not on the same page and that's something we as Caribbean people do but I find it a really important um, critical exercise to take from the perspective of the national always being regional so I on you know I feel just as um, honored when something happens for Suriname you know as when it happens for um, Cuba because you get this sense of like our celebration is everybody else's celebration. My national day today, you know, I know who are the people that are going to pop up and there's there's a certain um, ritualistic nature to that that reinforces what I'm trying to get across about the national and the regional. Definitely, definitely. And um, it's interesting how you how you frame that because I think that that national, that confluence between national and regional identities even extends um, a bit further. I, you are in Brazil right now, and um, I'm sure in your experiences, you have seen so many synergies between um, us in the Caribbean and the Brazilian reality. I mean, apart from the fact that over 50% of Brazil is of African descent, uh, so culturally there are a lot of synergies, but there's so many others. Um, and I know you've been in Brazil for the last two years. Tell us a bit about um, some of your initiatives and some of the work that Barbados has been doing in Brazil. Right. So, I mean, Barbados and Brazil have had this relationship of friendship, diplomatic ties for um, next year, we'll actually be celebrating 50 years. Wow. So it really is a sobering, like, as you say, 54 years of independence and think that our leaders had the foresight to reach out to Brazil shortly, just three years after, you know, us being in a position to do that, to ensure that we were um connected to this to the great nation of brazil the federative republic it became yeah. and so um our relationship with brazil goes back way even before 1971 mm -hmm. um and um i'd like to pause maybe in two moments of history to to tell you um and to answer your question sure. but to tell you about how this relationship is animated for me 
Um, so, and it, it will go back to the earlier points we were making about this Caribbean identity and how outside sometimes. So we know that um, there were large migrations at the beginning of the 21st century into Latin America. And we know that this is an area that requires way more study, a lot of attention. It's so rich. And I'm so happy that you and I have been able to have those kinds of um, really um, wonderful conversations about the kind of content, the material, sociology, you know, um, performance, um, you know, for so many camps of study um, can, can be looked at when we think about this um, relationship. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning of the 20th century, um, Barbadians, Barbadianos they're called, yeah. left yeah. Barbados on steamships in the boom of rubber and in the boom of um, you know what steel was making possible railroads markets and they came to the Amazon region as they'd gone to Panama's jungle right. and they helped to build something called the the Estradaje um, this is our Ferrovia de Madeira Mamore which is the, the ma Madeira ma, uh, Mamore ma Wood Railway right it's a mouthful yeah um, but it's so beautiful to hear spoken. Um, and so we came here to build a bridge that would connect, interestingly, Brazil and Bolivia mm -hmm. from the Amazon region going towards that sort of northwest region um, of the rest of South America. And so we came at a time where one of the descendants that I've been learning from, one of the scholars that I've been learning from, who include people like our very own um, Dr. Frederick Aline, who I'd also like to salute and say independence greetings to Dr. Elaine Rocha, who operates, uh, who was Brazilian, but put out important work called Miligon to Brazil that speaks to this Barbados-Brazil connection. One of the things that I learned from these scholars is that, you know, we came at a time when other people were coming. So there's also this, you know, sort of like Flatbush Avenue, which we know belongs to like the Caribbean in New York, but it's also a place where you're encountering Ethiopia and, you know, the Middle East, Africa, you're encountering through food and, you know, China and this. So that sort of thing is what feels like it was occurring as all of these migrants, not only from the outside world mm -hmm. um, of Brazil, but from within different parts of Brazil, came together in this um, Tower of Babel, a multilingual, multicultural space to work hard to build this railway. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then remained in Brazil to become a community. And I want to, to tell you that who is called Barbadiano are the people who arrived, who looked the same, but who looked different from Brazilians, who were blacker, in other words, they were more phenotypically African. Yeah. And for that, they were subject to, um, you know, being spoken of as a group. Right. And so when we, if we could take a, a, a um, you know, a cinematographic view in the past and imagine that the steamship is pulling out of Barbados, who's really on it are Trinidadians and Grenadians and other people from across the Caribbean, who by the time they arrive as this phenotypically um, perceptible group in Brazil are all called Barbadianos. Wow. So in as much as we have the um, last names, like, you know, you might find, you find uh, Maloney and you find Shockness and you find Lane, you find White, you find um, Brasswit, Griffith, which yes. is Griffith, you find um, what used to be squires that became Siqueira. Okay. Um, um, you, you find that who has been called Barbadiano, even if they were majority Barbadian because the ship pulled out of Bridgetown, yes. among yes. them would have been representatives of families from these other nations. Wow. So, and that happens at the intersection of what do these people look like, how are they behaving, what unites them, and how do we lump them together as a group as different and other. And it also puts them, puts me in the humble, um, perpetually humble position of being grateful for, to these people for finding and making community and maintaining community in Brazil some 200 years later. Wow. So the fact that I can go in a November to visit my Barbadian community and get the opportunity to know that there's somebody from St. Lucia who is of St. Lucian descent that runs the biggest archive of this Barbadian um, 
uh, research and, and promotion of this Barbados Brazil connection, yeah. Mr. Marcos Dacheville in Belém do Pará, mm -hmm. I get to, um, you know, realize, put myself in that history to realize that for all these reasons, the consciousness which these people had to have together across nationality, accent, skin color, you know, across the complicatedness of the way they were hailed to be, whether they were Afro descendant or real, real different people, you know, yeah. so I, I know you understand where I'm coming from and how that, how they have um, maintained this sense of pride. Uh, you know, I get carried away with this, Sean, but it really is something that I honor, I respect, and I wish to dedicate as much of my service time to um, sharing with the rest of the world, because it is a site of resistencia, resistance. Yeah. It is a site of um, our creative imagination, Definitely. and it is a site of our dignity as Caribbean people and having the consciousness mm -hmm. to um, uh, um, the consciousness to survive, if I can say it like that. Of course, definitely. And I mean, that, you know, what you related is, is I think so emblematic of many diaspora communities where, you know, they took on one particular label or another, but um, in many ways, it was a mix it of was, it was, um, mm -hmm. um, You know, there's the example it, of- You know, there's the example of Anna. Um, and, and um, other regions and, and like, other regions like this should happen yeah um yeah so in terms so, i mean of, i wanted to go ahead sorry. no no sorry sean go ahead no it's just um i'm i won't answer it i want to ask you to put it back exactly. so we can get to it but it is that question of therefore when we remove the national um sense of where you've come from in Brazil, mm -hmm. who else gets to become Caribbean um, right. within Brazil? Right. You understand? Or who else seems to have something that is also um, Caribbean, Caribbean and what is the site of that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, one of the things that, that happens when a group of people from Barbados or from, the Carib from other parts of the Caribbean come into a space um, like Brazil, and they come from independent nations where their realities have changed, where they, they're now able to reimagine themselves differently into the Brazilian space where many people of African descent are still in many ways um, not as free and not able to reimagine themselves um, in different ways. What are the dynamics of that interaction between the, the two different groups? Um, and and it's, it's, it's something that I think, as you rightfully said, requires a lot more study and a lot more contemplation for us to, to, mm -hmm. um, to drill down into the experiences of the people who migrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, of uh, and let's, let's move forward a little bit to where Barbados is today. And of course, Barbados is mm -hmm. part of the, the CARICOM region. Um, Based on your experiences as a, a public servant, as a diplomat, what do you see as possibilities for our region, for Barbados, um, moving forward in terms of our relationship with Brazil and Latin America? Yeah. Um, um, well, first of all, I, I will speak from my perspective um, here. Yes. 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 And so um, what I can say is that I'm really delighted with the reports I've received out of, uh, we have an excellent ambassador to CARICOM to whom I also send readings, His Excellency David Comichon. And um, this is um, a human being who is just one of the, the most genuine, passionate people. As he is passionate about Barbados, he is about this, this sense of our um, potential federative um, possibility or connection. Mm -hmm. And he also understands it, and I'm understanding that the institution of CARICOM, having set up AFCAR, having set up um, these African and Caribbean, uh, sorry, not AFCAR, uh, there's another name, I think it's the Africa Caribbean, the Africa Caribbean and Diaspora um, unit, but having, moving towards whatever these institutions become called, the fact of their existence, 
um, signals that the relationship with Africa at the regional level is mm -hmm. as important as it, as it has been for many of our countries at the national, you know, the bilateral level. Yeah. So you will, of course, know yeah. that Barbados would have established diplomatic relations with Ghana mm -hmm. and with Kenya, which are two, again, of the things that I would put into that category of where we are post-independence. We are at this place where nationally and regionally we're thinking in, in very large terms about what diaspora could mean um, uh, beyond sort of, you know, the sentiment of heritage yeah. in these strategic ways. Mm -hmm. We're talking about trade, we're talking about educational exchange, we're talking about transfer of knowledge and capabilities of human beings. So I think that um, my hopes sitting from where I sit yeah. are that we will find ways to bring Brazil into this and, and to, create sites of research for Caribbean and Brazilian studies, mm -hmm. to create analyses of the CARICOM agreement, for example, and how it affects trade multilaterally um, with Brazil, to resuscitate the CARICOM Brazil. Uh, the last time that a, a grouping or that the people came together for the purpose of the Car CARICOM Brazil discussions was actually 10 years ago. Wow. So we're in this really interesting um, moment of taking stock not only of where we said we wanted to go in in this you know one would look at this and go this is a super diasporic kind of you know initiative mm -hmm. um but in these very strategic ways brazil being as i said one of the world's most important economies certainly the most important in this region yeah. and um the caribbean being you know a critical um even uh, you know, critical site for trade, for transshipment, for, uh, politically, internationally, the Caribbean is. I don't think we. I don't think our citizens understand the extent to which um, we have such important voices. Yeah. And um, so I think that this question of where we go with the Caricom Brazil Africa relationship is ever more in this in this direction of embracing these diasporic connections, mm -hmm. which allow us to then become strategic in understanding, you know, where the opportunities are and going after them through strong diplomatic and other forms of action. So I, I'm very hopeful about it to say it in, in the briefest way. Thank you so much for that um, very positive um, and affirming response. And actually later today, um, our next conversation this afternoon at five is about that kind of South, South um, possibilities and perspectives and mm -hmm. uh, and potential for that and one of the in, one of the um, interesting things coming out of, of the possibilities that exist for you know greater connections between Africa the Caribbean and Brazil Latin America um, is the the element of education because of course for a long time we have been exchanged if that's the right word from each other due to issues of language, issues of difference, issues of um, mercantilism, you know, separate trading arrangements, etc. For you as a, as, as a diplomat, as the ambassador to Brazil um, from Barbados, how has it been operating at that intersection at finding ways to, or to navigate, um, educating people on both sides of the fence um, in the Caribbean and in Brazil? And of course, you know, um, executing your, your duties as a diplomat. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry if I put you on the spot. <laughs> no, I mean, this is, this is what these things are about. And it's, it's a beautiful question, Sean, don't you worry. The thing, the thing is that, you know, we are, at, we are in a moment in history where what education means, what diplomacy means, indeed what work means, um, we've just had to pause to, to, to anchor ourselves in the things that are true and that we can take forward mm -hmm. and to change those things that no longer serve us so that we do not perish, right? And so your question didn't come with the weight of perishing, but I wanted to infuse the sense of urgency that I feel around figuring all of what you asked me out and to allow space for that to be both anchored and unmoored at the same time. So what is anchoring about the fact of, you know, as I said, there, there are truths on, um, there are things that I wish to change, right, on, on both sides about the perception of what Brazil is or what Barbados is. 
my job is to create and share the most accurate, true, wonderful, you know, idea of Barbados that I can and to make create people make it such that the experience of what I do and say and how it, that is done endears them to my country and dares them to um, you know and the, the critical word there is honest yeah. and so um, I hold that as my line mm -hmm. you know what can I always share how can I educate people in a way that empowers them to want to go to go okay but this is a very honest representation of what this country is fortunately i'm from barbados and we're from the caribbean so things aren't too difficult no. when you say your nation is great it's, a um, it, it's not a hard job but, you know and i give thanks to that every day yeah. but there's yeah. there's also this question of you know who are we becoming as we move into deeper into the 21st century in the face of the challenges that we have you know Arrow Walton Barrow, the right on excellent Arrow Walton Barrow, the father of our nation, as he's called, in 1966, when he was signing those papers to say that Barbados is now um, an independent country, wouldn't have been grappling with climate change. Right. Um, he wouldn't have been grappling with the way in which COVID has impacted the world. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have been grappling at the time with, you know, what it means to create connections um, that don't require travel anymore mm. what it means mm. to um you know and so on and so on so what i'm getting at is that beyond the challenge of oh i may have said well as a you know as a diplomat can i do this and can i do that the answer is as a servant of my country and as a representative of the highest level of leadership of my country mm. what is the best thing that i can honestly creatively innovatively do to serve you know my country's needs in this moment mm -hmm. and this is an urgent moment where you know there are ways in which the call to um be conscious of our realities on both sides means that um you know facilitating contact at civil society level right. is where you find also some of the richest forms of exchange mm -hmm. and so i don't see it as every ambassador's job to be all things and all you know answers but to know where there are nodes of connectivity that can take themselves forward once they're put together, given the chance. Yeah. So as I as I grapple with what are, um, I think, really great um, questions of, and in fact, what, what, it, what you're asking me a question about what it means to be a leader in an international scenario, right? this is not special to me. It's, it's also your question as a professor in a, you know, in, in a university with international students. How do we build this international empathy how do we build up a body of, you know, literally this, this sense of international empathy is my national duty. Right. And that's where, um, you know, as I was preparing to come here today, that's where I cite these questions of consciousness okay. because they, they can therefore be, um, again, anchored in something to do with care, yeah. something to do with love and something to do with you know the spirit that created the profession of diplomacy the sort of most honored and one of the most honored and beautiful professions in the world but diplomacy comes out of this idea that we will never again go to war mm -hmm. we will never again allow ourselves to reach this this state of unconsciousness that we think it's okay to murder millions of people just so you know we, we this this profession was created so that people could be put in place to facilitate connections to facilitate understanding and so where Barbados and Brazil are concerned, um, I feel like this moment gives me um, great reason and great opportunity to share those moves, some of which we mentioned, but to, to stay to stay proud, mm -hmm. to stay um, conscious of where we are vulnerable, whether it's in the environment, whether it is where, you know, um, in, in terms of our service a economic activity being hampered, um, whether it is in the the vein of let's call it removing some of the remaining structures of the colonialism out of which we were born, yeah. you know, <laughs> it, it, it all of that is a matter of national consciousness, which as we're saying, once once that's the goal, 
um, you know, you find those connections. And, and I suppose my challenge is only where and how to make the best uh, facilitation, where and how to do the best facilitation. And so far, you know, Sean, I have to say that things have just been going really, really well. I feel very, very fortunate to be serving in Brazil at this time. And I, I, in my mind, I keep telling myself to mention Salvador mm -hmm. and the importance of Salvador and the importance of, you know, what it means for us as Caribbean people to, to feel like we have knowledge of this space that is, is like meeting, I don't, you know, like 20 million more Caribbean people, like yeah. a Caribbean that you didn't, nobody knows is there, but it is there. And that goes for the rest of Latin America where where there's unfortunately sometimes this in national invisibility um of of people who comprise um the way in which this part of the world was made out of you know out of you know the presence of of african and care you know african and indigenous and european people all coming all together, coming together. That's what happened in salvador as well exactly exactly and and this this notion of you know I loved when you talked about international empathy being di a direct um, being absolutely necessary for national identity, and and the yeah. connections that are critical and important to to just our survival as you know as the Caribbean as individual nations in the Caribbean as a region and and as an international community. Um, and, and that's what this, this festival really is about. It's about, you know, trying to help people to see those connections that exist between us that sometimes we, we either overlook because of any number of reasons. Um, and so, so it really warms my heart in a way to hear, to hear you talk about, you know, the, the we, you as a diplomat, and I'm sure many other diplomats like yourself, um, you know, use their energies to, to further connections and to build on those connections. Um, when we talk about uh, independence, as today's Barbados is independent, and Black movements across the Americas, um, you talked about resistance, the, the Barbadians who came to Brazil as, in a way, um, being resistant, and of course being resistant to, to whatever challenges they might have faced when they came to Barbados. Um, what are some of your thoughts about independence and, and some of the Black movements we're seeing kind of resurfacing in 2020 because of the challenges that are happening across the Americas in particular? Um, how, how do you approach that as a diplomat? Well, I mean, the, the, in one, uh, one phrase, I don't necessarily approach it, but I yes. contemplate it. I remain sensitive to it. Yes. And I understand what I have to understand at the, the deepest level, what is the call of the people who are being affected by certain phenomena that might bring them onto the streets, that might, mm -hmm. you know, bring them to, to, to criticism, that might bring them to a sense of disenfranchisement. Yeah. And again, the empathy that I must have as a person pretending to live and, and make friendships work between countries and people, I must be sensitive to those things. Yeah. Um, and as a human being and as a black woman, it, it is impossible for me not to be um, aware, sensitive, conscious, educated, um, and also aware of my positioning, mm -hmm. you know, a, around those things. So for me, um, these, you know, when I think about the movements, where I try to go to is what is the the best thing that I can do, yeah. given who I have access to, what I can be honest about, what I can do in a dignified way, and what I can do in a way that recognizes diplomacy is also about um, being conscious of the disenfranchised, yeah. being able to understand history in a way that structures are the structure of the reality is understood vis-a-vis -vis history. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain, in my view, always on already a certain decolonial perspective that any diplomat um, has to be aware of. And that's how I understand these movements. We're in a time where the structures that have resulted from our history mm -hmm. and the ills that they produce are able to be recorded, shared, and um, have an impact on ourselves, our psyches, our hearts, our bodies. Um, 
at an increased rate more so than any time in history yeah. and so being sensitive to that and what can be done about that is a part of my job as far as i'm concerned now we don't i can't what would be the point of me being in the street with a placard i don't right. think that's the right thing for me to do no, but also nice. but also um it doesn't mean that this question of what is what is wounding these people and what are the common solutions mm -hmm. that are being created at the site of these wounds um that is really important to me um, and I think important to us as 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 international public servants. Yeah. So I think as servants of an international, um, you know, a sense of uh, international hum huma uh, humanism, if yeah. I could put it like that. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think that one of the things I'm most excited about is the ways in which all of these movements that you referenced are becoming aware of each other and we are becoming aware that they're aware of each other and so the, the sort of, there's a distillation that happens once people encounter us say, wait oh you too and then you go oh but what is, what is what is it that we can now do together that perhaps we couldn't do, do before right. and what people are starting to do in my experience is not make more noise noise is certainly you know every method must be understood in its context of course. so i respect all of the people who um whose calling, whose positioning is to be in those situations where they have to use their voices and, and, and you know, and, and serve sometimes their bodies in order to bring consciousness to um, the disenfranchised people of the world. And so <clears throat> what, what, I, um, what I'm excited about is the ways in which the distillation process seems to be leading to institutional change, right. to policy change, and to policy change that also becomes something that can be infused as we become more and more aware of each other internationally, what we're doing, what our shared challenges may have been, and what examples we have to, to, to sort of like make them forevermore gone. Yeah. Okay, so we, we're in a moment where forevermore is the challenge of like, can people actually be trusted to, to, to to um, deliver information online to hungry students, <laughs> you know, forevermore. Can we really make this move forevermore? And it was made for us. Yeah. And so the question is, can we, for, you know, one of the questions that come up when we talk about the moment we're in in the black movements or at other social justice movements that we see um, across the world is that perhaps persons may not have known that there was a connection between you know, for example, Black Lives Matter and some of what's happening in Chile, they may not have understood that that there's an international empathy to be built between, you know, um, the Caribbean and other spaces in South America using using that as, as but a small example. And I, I think it's really you, you know, especially academics, people in the university, mm -hmm. um, not to shift this onto you, but to say to you that, um, <laughs> to say to you that the university, I think, and I, I'm, you know, the university and also the, the university beyond, which is what you're now here doing with these webinars, uh -huh. these spaces become critical sites of interrogation, information exchange, facilitating connectivity, and also abolishing forevermore some of the illusions that may have been holding us back in, you know, from our larger sense of world being. Yeah. And, and, and that's really what I think is coming out of these uh, movements. There is a larger sense of global belonging, mm -hmm. relevance, a greater international empathy. And to that extent, it's also be, it's also being, um, de, uh, uh, how do you call that? What I want to say is, it is losing its specificity of identity. Right. So we're we're building coalitions of empathy that go beyond identity yeah. by precisely embracing what is happening to people that look like us. Mm -hmm. And so we're called to a greater humanity by passing through that lens, but not staying there. Right. So when when people you know this when people the debate around identity politics and where it belongs, it certainly doesn't belong in. Uh, at the site of international empathy, right. but international em empathy must always take into consideration what is it that people are angry, disenfranchised, oppressed, um, 
and deny their humanity by? What is it that does that to them? And to be concerned with that. Definitely. Definitely. Ambassador, it has been, it's almost an hour. We've been talking for an hour, believe it or not. <laughs> Time flies when yeah. you're having fun. Um, and I know you have a busy schedule. Um, so my last question to you, um, this, these coalitions of empathy that you just talked about, um, it, it comes full circle when you mentioned, um, you know, the, the, prime, the current Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Mia Motley, bringing a certain kind of care and creativity and innovation um, to Caribbean leadership. As your, as your takeaway, if you had to talk to a young person who is coming up in the Caribbean, um, who's interested in political, um, a political career or some kind of political involvement, what would be your parting words for them with regards to the importance of building these coalitions of empathy and the importance of these things you mentioned, care, creativity and innovation in, in how they live their lives? in general yeah you know you you've thrown some really nice questions my way um sean i hadn't pre-thought this one but what occurs to me out of our conversation sean is that it, public service is just that mm -hmm. right there's a way in which you might see these mythic uh, figures appear like our great Caribbean leaders have been, not just in the Caribbean stage, but on the world stage. And they take on a mythic proportion. But if it's one thing that my prime minister in her, um, in her methods, in her conviction, in her um, clarity, in her humility, um, reminds all of us who are serving at this level is that if you are not centering other people and your concern for their well-being in the world, if you're doing this for yourself mm -hmm. and you're doing this to make fame, forget it, right? Because it's not, it's not going to work in our region. What you will leave are countries in tatters, mm -hmm. countries with debt, countries with corruption, countries with policies that don't work and don't know, I know how to fix them, <laughs> you know, just to... It's have to, to keep put it straight yeah. and and we've seen that happen time and time again um, at the site of politics so politics in the way that not just my prime minister but many of the ministers um, that serve Barbados I, I go home every year in October um, and I get to see the extent to which you know it's a relentless job to be a minister or a public servant, yeah. especially if you have yeah. ambassadors like some of us who who want to produce and who need this collaboration. We're constantly, you, you know, it's an on-demand thing. Yeah. So my parting yeah. words would be, um, know that you're doing it for the sake of others. Be clear about that from the beginning. And, and, and that is the one thing to, on which you should anchor yourself. And it comes back to what we've been talking about, this, this sense of, there's a dignity to empathy. Mm -hmm. There's a way in which, you know, one might think of the, the accolades of being an ambassador or being a prime minister. Absolutely, there is a great honor that comes with that. And there's a great sense of, you know, um, uh, I just felt myself get emotional. <laughs> um, there's a great sense of honor and responsibility that comes with that. But there is this sense that it is not even about you, right? And, and that is what I think any person who should be going into politics, who should be going into public leadership, should be thinking. Wow. Um, I, I, there's nothing that can come after that. I think that was the perfect um, ending to this conversation. And I want to really thank you for accepting the festival's invitation. Uh, to have this conversation, mm -hmm. this much needed conversation, um, and for taking time out of your schedule to chat with me today, Ambassador. Um, yeah. So, as I mentioned, we have uh, two more talks left today. Today is the last day of the festival, one on South South perspectives on possibilities at five, and then we end mm -hmm. the day with a conversation on charting our own courses, uh, businesses in the Black community, and a close closing ceremony at seven. So again, thank you, Ambassador. Enjoy the rest of your Independence Day. And uh, thank you. 
And Thank you enjoy for us too. Um, <laughs> we don't have a holiday, <laughs> but I'll try. <laughs> no, uh, but you know, have have whatever you can—a sorrel, a mavi, you know, a mavi, a, a rum, whatever—in celebration. Once you finished work, I just wanted to say, Sean, thank you too. As I, uh, you know, this is really an important space. These webinars, these conversations are breaking into something that will change history. And I, I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity of been here to, to have been here to talk with you. Um, I encourage you and all your team to keep doing what you're doing. And I look forward to um, the quality and the kind of work that I know you're going to keep uh, making uh, you know, not just in the Brazil, Barbade, Brazil, Caribbean space, but in this um, global space of how do we think about being together. So I just wanted to say thank you. And I'm deeply thank grateful you. for the opportunity to be here. Great. Thanks again. <laughs> bye bye. All right, my dear. Thank you so much.